Fuse webinar after uh, our Computational Science Symposium, which took place in March. We are glad to have everybody on the call today. Uh, this is Chris Decker, the Fuse FDA uh, liaison. And I'll be talking for a very short time today because I want to hand it off to a number of our co-leads across our working groups. I'm going to provide a really short overview of, of our event, which happened last month, another great and exciting event. Uh, and then I'll hand it off to our working group leads who will walk you through what they accomplished in that meeting and what their, you know, what their plans are as they look at the rest of 2017. So I think I hope everybody's excited to hear about what's going on and how you can get involved. And um, let's move forward. So to remind, I, I use this all the time. One, one of these days I'll probably take it off. But I uh, just wanted to reiterate the mission of the Computational Science Collaboration uh, with a focus really on the transparency and non-competitive environment and how we can bring people together to really push, uh, push product development forward uh, and get us to a better place. At the end of the day, we're here to help patients, and that's our, that's our goal. We do have five uh, or six working groups. We will be actually be making a, a tweak to this over the course of the next couple of months, so be on the lookout for that. Um, but we have a steering committee that sits above those five working groups um, and coordinates all the activities across those groups as well as with other organizations. So each of these groups will be talking today a little bit about their activities uh, and how you can get involved in what they've accomplished over the course of uh, the last year and, and what they're we're planning on for 2017. Um, there are a couple of links. If you go on the FUSE website, you can get more information about the working groups a list of the deliverables, any deliverables that might be under review, and then our wiki where, where our various groups post information about what's going on with their, with their projects. I wanted to quickly go over the, the symposium itself. Um, we met uh, again in Silver Spring, Maryland. We had over 320 attendees. We're busting at the seams uh, with members and attendees. Uh, we had 50 plus attendees from both FDA and, and about a, a half a dozen from PMDA. So our, our, our presence, our regulatory presence was extraordinary and was very engaged throughout the event. So uh, it was very, uh, very good to have them there and, and be able to collaborate and talk through some of the uh, various projects and items with them. Uh, we sold out, or sold out, we didn't charge for it, but we sold out our, our workshops on both linked data and our code repository. So they were very well attended and there was a lot of great information and interactivity in those, in those events. Um, I do wanna talk a little bit about the FDA session that we had on Tuesday afternoon. So we had a panel discussion of FDA and CDISC uh, and PMDA to talk a little bit about the standards with the guidance and the in, impending date last December. Um, there was a lot of good questions and healthy discussion on this. And you can actually go listen to this, and I'll show you in a moment. But uh, just one tidbit that came across in one of the questions, and this is just an example, but if you go look, if you go um, uh, review the recording, and I'll show you that in a moment, um, you can actually listen to it, that, that panel discussion. But uh, we did have a uh, question asked about the multiple versions in the, in the catalog. And again, just an example of some of the questions that were asked and answered. Uh, they talked about if there are multiple versions, you can use whichever one you, you want for your submission. So a lot of great questions came out of that panel. I, I, I suggest that you uh, go and listen to it. Um, I'm actually going to quickly jump over right now and show you that if you go to um, the FUSE website and click on USCSS 2017, and the presentations and posters, you will have a link to each and every one of the presentations from the event, uh, as well as an audio file of both the introductory FDA State of the Union, as well as the closing remarks, which includes the panel discussion. So you can listen to FDA, CDISC, and PMDA, answer a number of uh, very good questions that were presented by the audience in terms of moving forward with, uh, with, with the standards and submissions as well as uh, uh, the working group presentations and uh, upwards of 30 posters that were presented. Uh, we had our highest number of posters and some real high quality uh, um, posters and information that were presented. So I'm gonna jump back to my presentation real quick. Um, bear with me. Um, so now I'm gonna sort of hand it off. I didn't wanna spend much time because the information I share is really not all that that important. Uh, I really want to hand it over to the to the experts here on the phone and have them talk about what they did in their um, various groups, both at the at the conference and plans for 
for 2017. So I'm going to start by handing it off to Heming Tu from Accenture, who's going to talk about the standard analysis and code sharing working group. So Heming, it's coming your way. Bear with me for a minute. Um, okay, I see your window. Are you are you on? Yep, I hear your voice, okay. and I will hand it off to you. Okay, thank you. Hi everyone. I'm going to. Okay, I'm going to report what the. Our working group, the standard analysis and the code sharing working group uh, did during the meeting. But before I go into that, uh, probably we can talk a little bit about, uh, about the vision of uh, our working group. Uh, some of you may have seen this before. Basically, there are standards for each of the phases in clinical research, but uh, no standards exist. So our working group is focused to try to fill the gap there. And uh, this is the vision about uh, creating the script repository. And we know in the industry, all those, uh, maybe in the FDA, academia, you, we all do some um, uh, analysis or quite try to create some scripts to do display. So all those effort, we could uh, combine all those effort into one to create this script repository. What we have started from um, Fuse in 2012 is that we have chosen the repository and that the GitHub, the one that we're currently using. In this repository, we will try to host our uh, white paper and discussion or the meetings there. But we also want to have this repository host the, the scripts that uh, some uh, people contribute or we develop based on the white paper. And if you've seen this before, but there's a few things you may not uh, see in this diagram is that we add the test data there, and we have added the code test environment. This is the environment we want to create so that we can actually test the script that we put into the repository, you know, without having you uh, download it to your environment. And if you want to develop the code, we could use the code uh, test the environment to develop as well. And the, the further explain that vision is that each company you may have create uh, scripts here represented as a tools. So you may have a different tools. You may have tools that perform exactly the same function uh, the other company may have uh, created. So the idea is that if we create this common open uh, shared repository, then each one contribute a little bit. And uh, so in this uh, repository, we would have uh, more tools that everybody can use, right? And the uh, FDA already started contributing to the Jumpstart script. We already got the seven, we have got two runs of a review, and uh, actually some of the companies started using it. So FDA already gave the hammer here. I think I hope that everybody were using that, that hammer. And the others maybe, you know, some company has the scissors, the contributor to share that you can use. So the idea is that we have that kind of a shared open toolbox. In order to do that, we actually we form different uh, uh, sub working groups. We call the projects. Currently we have uh, uh, six active projects. One is that the repository under this project, we have actually four, four separate projects. The first one's the script discovery and acquisition, basically try to uh, get scripts that other contributed and reviewed and uh, basically to make sure it is it's going to be work uh, in the environment that the script described. And the repository and content that delivered, this group really focused on develop a script based on the white paper. The white paper has to define the target and all the table list and figures there. And then we want to create some uh, script that it actually uh, to create those uh, table figure and listing. And the second project repository governance, the infrastructure, this one basically is to make sure that uh, we follow some kind of a limit convention when we have sewer stored in there. We have some kind of um, uh, control in the repository. And if somebody wants to join the team, we have a, a developer team that we can add to that. And the repository is very open, everybody can access, but if you want to contribute, uh, you will have to join the uh, developer team. 
And the test of the data factory, that's the one Peter started. Uh, and this is one that really want to uh, create sets of a test data so that we can test the, the scenarios that in the analysis or even the display. So those, uh, we have some test data from uh, CDX pilot project, but those, the data they find that there's some scenarios we couldn't test. So that's why that this group formed. And the other ones, the, the analysis of display white pair, that's been there. We already have a, a team that are doing that for five years. And the, some of the final version of a white pair is already in the repository. Then the communication promotion and education team is to try to get all the information so, so that we can uh, promote what we're doing and maybe create uh, some kind of education uh, curriculum but that's in the, in the future. Right now, we, we still plan that. So the accomplishment that we have done so far is that we already have six white paper finalized. That's in the Fuse uh, catalog repository there. And the script repository, that's been there for uh, five years. And uh, we have scripts there, and uh, we have find out that people started using that. So that's that's great news because some of them are using it. They actually give back to say, "This is the script I used, and I did some tweak, and I want to you to put it back in the in the repository." So that that's great. And what we've done that uh, during the conference that we had uh, three demos. Uh, one is about uh, the repository, and another one is about the process how we can go through from the beginning of the script and to the end that we have the script documented basically we have defined a, a qualification process and then the third demo is about spotify so we have data we want to visualize whether there's any tools so actually the company lead company has contributed their spotify template so those templates are already in the repository and then we have a discuss a communication, education. Actually, there's a, uh, another maybe working group or project formed of basically for, so called Education for Future. And we have a um, meeting with them as, about that topic. And the, about the repository, we have uh, focused on that quite a lot. We have discussed the test data, what's the priority set of test data. And uh, if you want to have a script, what kind of uh, metadata you want to collect to describe the script and the, the test environment. And in those sessions, we find that there are lots of interest in R. So we feel that we want to maybe create some R script. Right now, we have some, maybe a couple of R scripts in the repository. But the focus main focus we was on the SAS. So we find that there's lots of interest. We may need to create a sub team on that. And then we have discussed uh, the plans for next few year. We call it fuse years. It usually start from March to next March. So uh, we want to uh, have a white paper, and there's other uh, white paper that are already in the plan. So there's about four that we want to uh, develop in the future. And then we had a joint meeting with different uh, working groups. So. In this conference, not just you know you work in your working groups, and we had the um, opportunity to talk to people in a different working group. Actually, the feedback is very positive on those uh, meetings. Now, our next step, we were focused on uh, continue develop white paper, and of some of the white paper, we really need to uh, do some uh, update as well based on the feedback. And then we're going to continue working on our uh, super repository, and we need to. Uh, actually, we need more people to join us to manage because since we get more scripts, there are more stuff that we need people to manage that. And we are going to kind of work on the test the factory project, and uh, we have identified priority data set that's going to be uh, developed uh, and will be made available. And then the communication part, we will continue to uh, provide uh, the information that we have and then maybe develop training materials. How to participate? Uh, if you want to join us, uh, you can join our uh, email list. Uh, there's this is like a um, list box uh, groups. This is information is in the wiki page. If you want to join, uh, you can go there to sign up. And then 
that's it. I think I'm going to hand it over to Jane. Thank you, I mean, for that summary. Yeah, we're going to hand it over to Jane Lozano now, who is one of the co-leads of our uh, Optimizing Data Standards group, and she's going to tell you uh, all the neat things going on within that group. Thank you, Chris, and good morning, afternoon to those that are on the phone. I am one of the co-leads for the Optimizing the Use of Data Standards. Susan Kenny has recently come on board as another co-lead for this working group, and I would be happy to provide an update on what we did during the CSS and what we plan to do. I do want to mention, though, with, in the survey, there was a survey done on Tuesday, and from what I remember, this was the working group that had the most people, the most involvement. It was wonderful seeing everyone and getting others involved as well. I will go through the projects and give a status update on those. The first one is one that Han Ming just mentioned, best practices for data collection instructions. This one actually started with the standard analysis and code sharing group. It has to do with the standard and out the code that they have, the scripts that they have for certain areas that they've noticed if it's not collected consistently and it goes all the way back to collection, then using these scripts is not as easy as it should be. What we're doing within this project in partnership with CDISC, definitely there is the collaboration with CDISC, is creating a white paper documenting the challenges and gaps with the C-CRF instructions, and also including recommendations for a future version of C-Dash. This is a new project. So we did, the, the group did meet with the standard analysis code sharing group, and they've got a good idea of what they're going to do and the direction they're going to go in. We had two sessions at the CSS, and also, as you can see at the CDISC interchange that happened after the CSS, they had very good discussions. Todd is the project lead and he was going to be setting up meetings with those that said they wanted to participate. He would always welcome actually more people too, if you're interested. We do have a CDISC representative. She was very active in the sessions. and. That is one thing that we want to make sure is that we are working very closely with CDISC on this project. The next one is actually a project that has been going on for a while. And Sandy did not have a session at the CSS, but what she did was find some additional folks to join the group. They're going to continue to work on the white paper. They want to finish that this year. But I do want to say congratulations to Sandy because she won an award at the CSS for her poster, sorting out the paperwork, which was a very, very good poster. And it made very logical sense. And actually some of the documents that we're doing within this working group was also included. The next one is the Data Reviewer's Guide in XML. That's also a new project. And they had very good sessions, and as you can see what happened at the CSS. They are still recruiting technical experts in the area of style sheet schema and XML development, but I think he, he got a lot done in these sessions and the goal of developing a data reviewer's guide, meaning the SDRG, ADRG in an XML format, which could then actually go into other documents as well. The next project is split up into two. It's a very long project name. I think we probably have the longest project names of all working groups. This is Define XML. One group is going to deliver a completion guidelines document and the other one is on the style sheet. For the completion guidelines, you can see who the project leads are. But Profola is a new lead with Marcelina on this project. I'm not going to read every point on the slide, but as you can see, they have a goal of when they want to complete, what is in scope, what is out scope, what is out of scope. It will also include send. We want to make sure that they are involved too because there are some things that are 
consistent amongst the style sheets, there's completion guidelines. There's some things that are different, but then there are also some things that are very similar. You can see what is out of scope as well. They really needed to define that, what is in scope and out of scope, so that they can get to their completion. The second part of it is around the style sheet. And they are going to first, the group, as you can see in phase one, development of a style sheet for regulatory submissions. They plan to have something available for review by the CSS Steering Committee around July 1st. Following our process of how de deliverables are reviewed, it goes to the CSS Steering Committee, which does have FDA representation on it. So we're looking forward to seeing that style sheet. And you can see also on this slide what they plan to do along with the style sheet development and what they plan to do in phase two. Now, I know these, both Marcelina and Dimitri and Lex have been working on this for a while and they had some really good sessions at the CSS. The next one is one that, one that I've had for a while as well, the Legacy Data Conversion Plan and Report. We had some wonderful conversations around scope and what does, what does legacy mean? It's really not as easy as we think it is in determining what, what, what is legacy. Is it everything that comes off of a EDC system? We were able to, to put that in a more solidified state. We also met with non-clinical and actually determined that the definition of legacy is not the same for them. And they will need to provide a, a definition for that because once you have that definition of legacy it helps you decide when do I need to put in a legacy data conversion plan and report in the SDRG or the ADRG or both it really depends on what you're converting the technical conformance guide shows three different examples and actually where some of the traceability issues are and definitely for sure in those examples in the technical conformance guide says, yes, you really need a legacy data conversion. But we also have included, if you have SDTM in 311, that is no longer supported per the data standards catalog. Anything that gets upversioned, you might have to put in a legacy data conversion plan and report. The whole idea is to show that traceability. And if that can't be explained in the reviewer's guide or an annotated CRF or the defined document, then we know that there's really more information that needs to be provided to a reviewer. We have to show that traceability. So that will be included. Now we can work on the completion guidelines and updating those for the, first of all, we're gonna start with just the clinical SDRG. There is an update to that template that we have created. Very, It's very basic. It's not getting into a whole lot of detail because we know that conversions are different. Every conversion is different, but it addresses the issues, the questions that FDA is interested in as documented in the technical conformance guide. So that is available. Now we need to start working on those completion guidelines and the example document. And we've got others, uh, people signed up for that, and I'm starting to have meetings for, for those two subgroups. The next one is, this is a huge project. This is the SDTM Atom Implementation FAQ, which really there's a lot there around the implementation and the, of, the different, of the different versions of the standards and the nuances that exist. What this group did actually created six different subgroups and they completed some reviews of question and, and responses, drafted responses within four of the subgroups. I didn't have really room on the slide to list what those were. They are currently recruiting leads for two other subgroups, therapeutic area specific and legacy SDTM mapping, which probably goes along with what I'm doing and we'll make sure that we have to have that communication. But we really had to put it into different subgroups and to say, okay, this is what we're focusing on because it's such a big, it's, it's big. There's a lot going on with sponsors now having to submit standardized data and being able to do it the right way. 
we there were sessions oh there will be sessions at the EU CSS in June in London going over this project the technology piece we're still working on there is a format to submit questions it actually goes to a personal Google email address we need to get that fixed so that it Google form is actually tied to the wiki and then we also need a way to publish the current questions and answers because there are some that were there the team is ready to publish once again we need to review it. the CSS steering committee needs to review it but they're ready to put those out there and we need to figure out the best way to do that so people can see that and also the a way to to pose the questions also still working through that technology piece but they've made a lot of progress this started last year and they've really they've done a fantastic job on putting it all together the next one is the study data standardization plan that another one is one that I've been working on we had wow a lot going on at the CSS we met with CBER they have their own version of the study data standardization plan however we came to the agreement that we would just use one and have an appendix to the SDSP that is more related to CBER but they were going to use what we have we also got feedback from FDA from their FR notice for intent to review and implemented some changes to the template we are still waiting for the additional comments the hope that I have is by the time we get all those comments and the next update to the technical conformance guide is to have this template completion guidelines example documents out on the wiki as a deliverable it's out there now on on the wiki but I want to have it out there as a deliverable like we have with the reviewers guides that is my that is my plan and that is the goal that I am shooting for for this plan sponsors are using this I've used this multiple times have sent it in to FDA as its own standalone document and have actually received response so I know they're looking at it and it's really good to the purpose of this is to be able to have those conversations with FDA early on what standards now that we're following what's in the data standards catalog and to have those conversations early early on and it is a living document so it goes all the way up from pre IND to the NDA possible new projects we actually had a roundtable discussion on Tuesday to say hey what what are some of the things you'd like to see us do what bubbled up is having to do with PMDA and what are they requiring we have the JPMA user guide for the ADRG and Susan is going to be working through that on what are the differences between FDA and PMDA and and how can we how can we help with that do we need to update yeah we probably do need to update the ADRG but how and what needs to be updated that's what Susan is going to be working on another idea that came up and it's something that that I've actually thought should be a good project is when you integrate data we what I've done in the past is taken an SDRG because it's an integrated SDTM and modified it for the integration and it would be nice to have something another SDRG or something that when it's not just one study but it's multiple studies and what happened when those studies were integrated there are sometimes changes that are made to the data within an integration and it's once again showing that traceability but gearing it more towards an integrated database you could also have the legacy data conversion plan and report if and I have seen this happen where upversioning occurs in an integrated database I wouldn't recommend it but it has happened another project that actually is out on the few site is implementing the whole who drug b3 format that is coming and how do you integrate that and if you have an integrated database you're integrating studies that are in the old format now you have the b3 how do you how do you do that that is out on the few site and if you go under working groups there at the bottom calls for new projects and ideas and that is where I need to page down if I can page down 
me see. Oh, here we go. That you will see that it is down here, implementing the new drug B3 format. I will probably have a couple of other things added to that as well, but please go out and, and look at that and other projects that are out there. Okay. okay. All right. We Thank you so much. Up, Jane? I'm yes, I am done. Great. Awesome. I am done. Okay. Yep, that's it. Thank you. I'm trying to catch up some time here. So I thank you for all that great information. We'll have these slides up on the on the website within a few days. So if you guys want to come back to them and reference them or reach out to the group, you can. So I'm going to hand it off now to uh, actually Scott Balvuni is going to be stepping in for uh, Tim Williams and talking about the linked data uh, working group. So Scott, take it away. Cool. Can you see my slides and hear me okay? I can hear you and see your slides. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much. So as a reminder, if people have questions, please feel free to type them into the uh, GoToWebinar chat and we'll get to those at the end of the presentations if we have time. So I'm going to give you a quick update on the linked data and graph database working group and give you a readout from our CSS. So um, we held another workshop um, as an in, that was an introduction to linked data and graph databases. Um, the the goals for that workshop were just to kind of be hands-on and give users the opportunity to kind of understand a little bit about the technologies but then actually to work with rdf which is um, one of the linked data frameworks as well as uh, neo4j which is a um, different type of graph technology but a second graph technology that's a labeled property graph um, and this is really the First time, to my knowledge, that, that that we sort of had this CSS IT team. So we rented laptops for people to use. We were, you know, spinning up uh, uh, IP addresses on the fly, and there was a lot of uh, just kind of great behind the scenes work that went into this uh, workshop. And Tim did an amazing job uh, putting it together. And I think the um, thirty plus attendees that we had, um, you know, walked away from it uh, feeling like they got. Uh, uh, a lot out of it. So we're actually going to run a similar but slightly different workshop at both the EU CSS and, and the annual conference, annual conference, and you'll see in a few slides what I mean by similar but, but a little bit different. At the 2017 CSS, uh, Tim also kicked off a project that he's been co-leading with Armando uh, Oliva called SDTM Data as RDF, and what uh, these two gentlemen have been doing in advance of the kickoff of this project is working to develop a feature-proof uh, ontology in RDF for the representation of clinical data. One might say that might be a new standard for uh, representing uh, clinical data. So as one of the, the goals of this project is to actually be able to produce these compliant artifacts from this ontology, meaning that they can shove clinical data into it and extract out of it uh, SDTM data sets that are compliant to uh, CDS business rules, Atom data sets that are compliant to CDS business rules, as well as the underlying metadata that today, in today's world, we spend a lot of time compiling and defined at XML. So at um, the 2017 CSS, we had uh, over 20 volunteers um, want to participate in this project, and we just had the first uh, post-CSS uh, teleconference for this SDTM data as RDF project, and a lot of those folks uh, showed up. So it's if you are interested uh, in kind of getting involved in this perhaps next generation uh, of data standards, I'd encourage you to reach out to Tim uh, and get involved in this project. It, like I said, the, the first meeting after the CSS just occurred, so it's still early, early days, so it's an op excellent opportunity for folks to kind of get involved and just kind of get a better understanding of uh, the ability to move away from, from rows and columns, if you will. So that's really what our other activity at the 2017 uh, CSS was about. The linked uh, data and graph database working group held a linkathon. And our planned objectives for those uh, hands on sessions were really to evaluate uh, RDF and uh, Neo4j property graphs uh, against SAS version 5 transport as an alternative way to. Uh, transfer data uh, to between uh, different people within the same company or transfer data to regulatory agencies. So as, as most folks uh, on the phone are, are most likely know that you know in today's environment, if we're sending data to reg, reg authorities, it needs to be in a SAS version five transport format. There was a project in the Emerging Trends and Technologies Working Group that Ian Fleming will talk to in a moment that looked at 
alter developing criteria for alternatives to the SAS version 5 transport. So what this linkathon was intended to do was to actually evaluate RDF and uh, Neo4j as two alternatives to it. So the actual outcomes of this session, which I think were actually, I would argue, more beneficial than uh, what we intended to do, uh, was actually we had people just break out into smaller groups and take two SDTM artifacts, a demographics domain and an adverse events domain, and then try to represent them um, in a graph. And I think coming out of those sessions, we had three groups that did this, and they actually were able to recognize the benefit and the business value of representing data in a way that's different than the rows and columns that we currently do. The other um, piece to that is the folks that were, were going through this exercise did recognize the challenges of developing a new clinical data standard. So I know that CDISC has done a lot of great work and it's been challenging for them to come up with consistent data standards. So I think the, the folks in this in the room in this session you know, got a good understanding or realized that some of the difficult work that the folks at CDISC are doing and, and if we would move forward trying to develop something else or, or an alternative that it's, it's not going to be a, a snap of the fingers and we have a new data standard tomorrow. So folks in the room were able to just kind of whiteboard, hack, and have fun. And I think they were really productive sessions. So I just want to show you a, a quick example of what we were able to do just in the course of two days. So this is a uh, Neo4j property graph model that of one of the actual um, whiteboard representations that one of the groups came up with. So you can see you know, things that are familiar to you. We have this concept of a study subject. You have investigators, a study, a country you know, race, sex, ethnicity, so things that you would typically find in a demographics domain. And I'll give uh, Ian Fleming credit for, you know, putting this into EO, Neo4j and, and then putting some data into it as well. So again, uh, we had these small groups break out, and this was a model that they just sort of came up with, you know, within the, within the con uh, you know, context of two to two to three hours. So then we were able to take this uh, SDTM data from the CDISC um, SDTM pilot and actually take this data and put it into that graph that you just saw on the previous slide. And the kind of the cool thing for me is we were able to actually extract out very easily with the simple queries, the same SDTM data. And we could extract it out in either a DM domain that was conformant to the CDISC PMDA rules or an SDTM DM domain that was, oops, it should say conformant to the FDA rules on, on the second, um, oops, sorry about that, on the second, uh, uh, sorry, second uh, example here. So if in the technical conformance guide, the FDA has a certain way that they want screen failures to be represented, which isn't quite the same as what's in your SDTM implementation guide. So you can see we were able to put that data into a graph and extract it out in a way that's either compliant with CDISC rules or, again, I'm sorry for the header on that slide, or compliant with FDA rules. So again, I think that's, that's pretty cool to be able to do that just within the span of uh, two days at the CSS. So with that being said, I'm going to now turn it over to Ian Fleming to talk to the Emerging Trends and Technologies Working Group. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yep. Okay, let me go full screen here so you can see it. Okay. So I'm going to give you a quick update on the Emerging Trends and Technologies Working Group. Uh, we have a number of projects kind of going on at the moment in various stages, uh, some, some that are ending or, or uh, you know, near completion, some that are ongoing, and some that are actually brand new, and I'll try to go through those. Um, and, and normally, uh, Jeff Lowe is the one who does a lot of these things, and these slides are from him. So if uh, anybody has any questions or anything uh, afterwards, please feel free to contact either Jeff or myself, and we can follow up and answer any questions you might have. Um, so the first project is actually the alternative transport format uh, project that Scott had referred to before. Um, the intent of this project was really just to, uh, you know, maybe get away a little bit from the SAS version 5 transport files that we're currently working with and some of the limitations that are, uh, uh, are inherent in, some, in that particular data format. So this one's been going on for a little while, I think a little bit over a year. Um, the, there is a paper that's been worked on that is very close to completion. Uh, it's actually going to be uh, submitted to the uh, steering committee this week uh, for review and approval. There isn't going to be a uh, phase two currently. Um, as part of the process of this alternative transport format project, they had actually developed a, a survey and sent it out to the entire FUSE community. And the uh, response rate was actually pretty low. Uh, I think they had actually sent it out to many thousands of people. And I think the response, uh, they only got a couple hundred responses. So 
um, you know, I think you just need to take the whatever came back and that, um, you know, the survey results there is probably with a grain of salt, uh, just because it, we weren't particularly sure if it was representative of the whole community, but we did get some valuable information from it that we did work into the paper uh, that people will be able to read after it gets approved. Um, I think uh, one of the findings from the working group was that a lot of people are very set in their ways around these kind of things. Um, and uh, how exactly do we create strong imperatives to, uh, to motivate substantial change in this area? So getting away from um, you know, SAS uh, version 5 and then maybe also moving on to a different uh, type of format as uh, Scott had alluded to before that maybe gets away from like a two-dimensional type of thing to something that's a little bit more robust and multidimensional perhaps. Uh, the next one is actually the Cloud Adoption Working Group. This is the uh, project is actually, this is the project that's been going on the longest within the Emerging Trends and Technologies Working Group. I believe they were present at the very first uh, CSS that occurred and they're still going strong. Um, I have to credit Tony uh, with uh, be, basically being the organizer and uh, the driving force behind uh, behind this working group. Um, you know, they, they previously had developed uh, barriers to cloud adoption um, and right now what they're doing is they're actually trying to um, reassess some of those things and, and, you know, agile process, trying to make sure that they still apply and see if they could be uh, refined in any kind of way. Uh, they actually have a number of del del deliverables that they're currently working on, uh, a white paper, an updated white paper, which is actually at version four. Uh, I think it's on hold for now, but they do still have a version three that is out there that people can review and take a look at if they want to learn more about this. Um, a bunch of uh, what-if scenarios and how to adopt scenarios. And I think these are addendums to that, uh, that white paper. Uh, and so in the terms of uh, people reviewing these types of things, how exactly are some of, what are some of the real world scenarios and things like that that uh, need to be addressed when doing cloud adoption. Uh, they're trying to actually help people uh, better understand um, how they're doing some of these things. Um, and then other evangelizing initiatives. I think of all the working groups that we have or the projects that we have, projects that we have in this working, uh, these, uh, uh, in the Emerging Trends and Technologies Working Group, this one is probably um, the one which is the, the best uh, publicized, I think, uh, which makes sense because it is the one that's been going on the longest. But also is the one where uh, a lot of different organizations, whether it be regulatory authorities or uh, individual companies, have actually taken some of these white papers and, and done things with them. Um, and so of all the working for their projects in this working group, I think that this one uh, is the one that actually has shown the most real world uh, significance uh, for people. Um, we also, um, uh, I think there's a desire to actually have uh, FUSE or representatives from FUSE or, or from the industry actually maybe approach the FDA uh, commissioner's office and talk to them about cloud community computing and maybe how we can work together, uh, industry and uh, regulatory bodies on, on advancing this. The next one is our uh, data visualizations working group. Uh, we actually have three groups within this project. Um, the first one is the best practices uh, for innovative, or sorry, interactive analyses for decision making and submissions. The second is the use of data visualizations for subject level data review. I think a lot of people are familiar with this one uh, from a, a, a realistic perspective and that it includes a lot of patient profiles, patient narratives, and things like that. Uh, there is some real world evidence um, uh, that, that's involved in this as well. The use of data visualizations for data anomaly detection and the use of data visualizations for study level data review. Uh, this project has actually been going on for quite a while. They had a little bit of a refactoring um, in the past, uh, I don't know, six months or so, uh, but I think they, they are in a good place right now and I think they're moving forward and obviously anybody who wants to uh, get involved in any of these, uh, please let us know and we can put you in touch with the group leads. Uh, but I do think that they're working for or moving forward on all of these different aspects and hopefully they'll be producing uh, a number of deliverables that people can take a look at and, and start using in their regular work. Uh, this one is actually a newer one. Uh, it's evaluating the use of FHIR in clinical research. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, FHIR is actually um, a, a technology or a standard that actually is being developed and published by HL7. Uh, which is a bit of a, a sister organization, maybe that's not the right word, but it's a, a group kind of like CDISC, except they deal more with healthcare um, rather than life sciences. And I think uh, Jeff was actually the one who started this. He's been uh, working pretty heavily with HL7 and going to a number of hackathons and things like that. And so he was the one who submitted this particular project 
request and it was accepted, but he is not the one who is running this group. Um, there are actually a couple of other people who are running the group and they met for the first time at the CSS uh, in March. And so far, uh, I think what they've, what they're trying to do at, the, at first is actually try to educate people about what fire is and why it's useful. Um, it's not necessarily just uh, the people in the group, but it's also leads. Uh, a lot of people are actually just trying to figure out, um, you know, what is fire? Why is it useful to us? How, um, you know, how can we use it to kind of move forward and, and do interesting things and stuff like that? What they're going to be doing is they're actually taking a, a EHR database, which is publicly available on GitHub, and they're actually going to be extracting a number of things from that database, uh, creating SDTM data sets, and then trying to actually um, create annotated CRFs and, and, and SDTM and fire resource, uh, uh, you know, annotating CRF with a fire resource and things like that to see which, uh, you know, why or how this particular technology can be available and what we can do with it. Um, and ultimately, their goal is actually to determine if the data is available in fire resources, how can we make use of it in clinical trial submissions? How can it help us uh, speed, our, uh, speed our process? Um, this is a little bit of background on that, uh, just uh, a little bit more about the, uh, the synthetic mass database from MITRE. Uh, if anybody wants to read about that, it's available on GitHub. Uh, and I think if, uh, if anyone wants to uh, join this group or hear anything more about what they're trying to do, you can obviously contact Jeff or myself uh, and then also contact the, uh, the project organizers to get involved. Um, as a shameless plug from Trisha and Chrissy, uh, who are the project leads, uh, if anyone is interested to do any work with us, um, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely a brand new thing. Um, you know, even the technology, uh, for some of us who are more on the technical side of things, the technology is still a little bit uh, new and raw, and so we need to understand uh, a little bit more how this works. And so if you are a curious individual who, uh, you know, likes new things, I would say uh, definitely contact uh, Trisha or Chrissy or Jeff or myself and we can get you involved. Okay, and the last one uh, is Educating for the Future. Uh, this is the shameless plug for, for me because this is a, a project that I had actually initiated and was just approved a couple of months ago. Um, it was so new that we didn't even get a chance really to meet at the CSS. Um, there was a presentation of the Emerging Trends and Technologies Working Group talking about the background for this working group and why uh, we think we need it. Um, but in essence, essentially what this working group is, it's intended to formulate topics and methodologies intended to help educate the FUSE community on trends and technologies that are occurring outside of our industry. Ultimately, um, you know, there's a lot of things that are occurring outside of our industry, uh, and we are uh, somewhat insular, um, you know, in our, our methodologies and processes and tools and things like that, and there's a lot going on outside of our industry. For example, uh, you know, things like data science. Um, I think what we consider to be data science is actually a very different thing than what the broader technology community considers to be data science. Uh, and so trying to figure out, um, you know, if we have a gap there and what that gap is, how exactly do we educate people on that more broadly accepted definition of data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, design thinking and user focused development, and also hyper, hyper agile software development and deployment. These are things that, uh, you know, the broader technology community has advanced uh, very quickly on um, and we haven't necessarily kept up. Uh, but these are just some examples. These aren't necessarily the topics that the group is going to work on. Uh, but the next steps for the pro or for the project are actually to kick off the working group. We have about 18 volunteers at the moment. Um, we are going to finalize the project scope and how we work with other working groups um, in the process of developing um, the proposal for this. I think what we realize is that there are a lot of other working groups who have very similar type of concerns around education. And um, education isn't something that um, FUSE has actually taken head on um, you know, in, in, in a large uh, format in any kind of way and so we're trying to figure out um, you know if we are breaking new ground here how exactly do we do that and what is our scope and and, and what ex how exactly do we handle this um, picking the initial topic areas this is probably going to be a somewhat of an agile type of process to say that we're going to pick a couple of pro uh, you know topic areas we're going to uh, create some teams choose some topic leads for those particular topics and then in each one of those topic areas we will um, you know develop a education plan for each one of those um, and that education plan uh, I don't think that Fuse would necessarily get into the business although this is maybe speculating I don't think Fuse would get into the business of actually conducting classes or anything like that on a lot of these things I don't know if that's true or not 
Um, but ultimately, I think these education plans are going to try to highlight what a lot of these gaps are, why this particular topic is important, and then also providing resources uh, for people to go out and educate themselves. So whether that is online courses or uh, you know face-to-face -face courses or or other conferences or anything that people can go to to kind of uh, you know get better educated about these things, uh, I imagine that the education plans will uh, involve a lot of those things. Um, I think that's it from the Emerging Trends and Technologies Working Group. Uh, so I think at this point, I will probably hand back to Chris Decker. Is that correct, Chris? That is. I think we're going to try to, um, Jane, Siri, have we been able to? Uh, is, uh, is this Patty, you? can you hear me? Hey, I can hey. hear you. Okay. Um, I have not been able to log on, but if you could put out my slide. I am. That I way. am. Yep, I am in the uh, middle of putting up your slides, so hopefully you will see them. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And then that. you just tell me next slide in the Vanna White kind of way. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay, so today I'm going to give an overview of the work that the Non-Clinical Topics Working Group did at CSS this year and also talk a little bit about our ongoing projects. The Non-Clinical Topics Working Group is led by myself and Sue DeHaven, and you'll notice links throughout my presentation today that will allow you to access information on our group projects and contacts and our deliverables. The Non-Clinical Topics Working Group had, I would say, had a very successful meeting at CSS this year with over 60 attendees and representation from regulatory agencies, pharma, software vendors, and CROs. Next slide, please. So over the two days, we had some really great presentations that were informative and helpful in identifying send implementation issues that needed to be addressed. Um, on Monday, we started off with the FDA Division Director of OCS, Lillian Rosario, who highlighted our framework for SEND implementation. Um, she provided us with several project ideas and also strongly encouraged industry to um, submit SEND data before December. And this was followed by the Send Fit for Use Industry Panel, which I would say was definitely the highlight of many at CSS this year for the Non-Clinical Topics Working Group. Um, this involves seven companies that took part in the Fit for Use pilot, and they discussed the lessons they learned from participating in the pilot. And this was the first time industry had actually presented what they had learned, so it was a really informative. Um, we had a great demonstration of some new visualization tools uh, to look at SEND data, specifically histopathology data. And then this was followed by a great discussion on the possible visualization of other domains, including some cross-domain visualization. And on Tuesday, we had a collaboration between CDISC, a discussion on the collaboration between CDISC and FUSE and how the two groups have worked together on projects in the past and possible ways they could collaborate in the future. And I would say another highlight was the presentation of our second annual SEND readiness survey. Um, that I just want to let everybody know that the full survey results are posted on the wiki and accessible through the link here. Um, so compared to last year, many more have submitted SEND data sets to the FDA, probably as a result of the Fit for Use pilot, and many more producing SEND data sets. However, um, they appear to be using these data sets for visualization and for a data warehouse because relatively few have been included in IND and NDA submissions. Um, next slide, please. So over the course of two days, we came up with a list of over 20 project ideas, which we narrowed down to the three that you see here. Um, we had one addressing the non-clinical ADA data modeling, another addressing um, questions regarding the defined XML file for non-clinical studies, and a third on managing standard versioning. 
So while the non-clinical ADA modeling project, which I'll talk about more in a few minutes, is ready to move forward, um, there is still some ongoing discussion with clinical and CDISC stakeholders regarding the other two projects. Um, we had two projects that wrapped up this year. Um, the end model, investigation of endpoint modeling for biomarkers published their white paper um, with recommendations on methodology for including biomarkers in a SEND data set. And I believe many have already found that white paper very helpful. And we had the test submission project also wrap up. And this pro um, group was very instrumental in the creation of the very successful fit for use pilot. Um, and so as part of the pilot, both industry and FDA agreed to publicly share the feedback and the lessons learned from this pilot so that everybody could benefit, not just those who had participated. And you can actually find the feedback provided by FDA and industry um, that's on the CDISC website, and it can be accessed through the link at the bottom of the slide. Next slide, please. So we have seven projects continuing from 2016 forward into 2017, and I'm going to briefly quick go over them. Um, additional information about these projects and contact the co-leads can be found on the slides. So you can reach out to any of the um, co-leads to get involved in the projects. There are three that are focused on SEND analysis and visualization. The visualization of histopathology group is turning their focus this year to SEND visualization for cross-domain and multi-study analyses. And our non-clinical scripts group, co-led by Bill Hauser and Kevin Schneider, will continue work developing analysis scripts for SEND data that they'll make available on GitHub. And they also have a great collaboration with the Histopathology Visualization Group exploring the development of visualization tools. And last, we have the application of SEND data for analysis project. And they're currently working on their white paper to wrap up the work um, that they've been doing over the past two years, outlining um, the relationship between non-clinical study tables and associated SIN variables, um, which I think many will find very useful. Next slide. Um, then we have our four projects focused on SEND implementation. The impl SEND implementation group, which has been around for several years, will continue their valuable work providing SEND expert advice. Um, on frequently asked questions and maintaining a non-competitive discussion forum. The NSDRG project that's co-led by Sue and Deborah will continue its work maintaining the template as well as providing examples for new study types as requirements are developed. And the industry sends progress survey will conduct its third annual survey um, this year that they'll present the results of at CSS 2018. And they're working this year to revise some of the questions to get a clearer picture of the readiness of industry. And last but not least, our data consistency group is hard at work on their white paper uh, addressing the inconsistencies that they identified between the study report and SENSE data sets. Okay, next slide. Can we quick get our new project in? So fresh out of CSS, we have a new project on modeling anti-drug antibody data for in non-clinical studies. Um, and this is a somewhat of a follow-on to the endpoint modeling for biomarkers project that just wrapped up. The scope of this project is to provide recommendations for modeling ADA data. Um, taking into consideration the current clinical approaches to ADA data, and they're also going to consider the appropriateness of modeling ADA data for visualizations. So we're putting out the call for participation in this project. If you have expertise on clinical or non-clinical ADA data collection and submission, uh, the project group would be especially interested in hearing from you. 
So please reach out to Mike, Thomas, or Gretchen to participate in this project. Uh, last slide, please. Um, I just want to thank everyone who was involved in making CSS so productive and looking forward to the outcomes of these our each ongoing projects. And I would love to encourage anybody to join one or more of our projects to reach out to myself or Sue or any of the project co-leads to get involved. Thank you very much. <laughs> And thank, thank you very you, much. For, <laughs> no problem. Thank you. I know we're just a minute or two over, um, and I think we did have a question or two, but I think we'll um, we'll hold those because of the timing, or we'll we'll send out a uh, after. But I did want to. Um, um, hold on, I'm trying to close my window here. Um, I did want to highlight one quick thing before everybody hangs up. Let me jump over here. Um, we do have coming up, and it was mentioned a few times. Um, our Computational Science Symposium in Europe. We had this event for the first time last year and it was very well attended and a great session. Uh, and we're hosting that again this year in June. So in just about two and a half, uh, two months or so, uh, we'll be having the event in London. Um, and I encourage those from, from Europe or, or those in the US who wanna take a quick, quick jaunt across the pond. Uh, we've identified a subset of projects uh, from both the CSS projects as well as other FUSE projects uh, around data transparency. We'll have the non-clinical topics group meeting on, on a number of uh, those projects that Patty just described. Uh, the Future Forms Technology Group, uh, Emerging Trends Technologies, the FIRE project, uh, Standards Analysis and Code Sharing Group. Um, we'll uh, continue the SDTM Atom Implementation FAQ project. And looking at what Scott was talking about in terms of sort of reimagining the STTM data and some of the work that he showed. So it's going to be a really exciting event over two days in Europe. Um, so I encourage you, it's filling up fast if you want to get a poster in uh, by the end of um, this week. I believe it's the end of this week to get that poster in. Um, it should be a great event. So I encourage you to attend. So without further ado, as, as we're over, I will uh, wrap up the webinar. I thank everybody for coming. We've recorded this, so we'll be sharing it in the next few days along with our presentations. And you can share that with your colleagues and other people within the FUSE community. So I hope this was informative and you learned a lot about the tremendous amount of work going on amongst the, uh, the working groups. And I hope you got an inkling or an itch to uh, email and, and uh, join in and help out. So hope everybody has a, a great rest of the day and week, and um, we'll be signing off.